Yo, guys, it's Kyle coming at you from Bane Stone Reviews. Today, I am sitting down with Sabina Bayaracha, the writer, director, and producer of Sevap Mitzvah, which is a fantastic short film, which is based on a true story that I don't know if you, if you don't see this movie, I don't know if you'd believe it. It's beautiful and fantastic, and it talks a lot about reciprocity and just about being a good person. And I had the pleasure of watching it last week, and I'm so glad that Sabina is here with me today to talk about her film. So thank you so much. How are we doing today? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, I'm I'm doing great. How about yourself? Yeah. I'm doing very well. well. I'm sitting down with you, so it's it's a good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flattery will get you far. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, but so before we get into the actual film, I am curious how you got into filmmaking in the first place. Well, I, I wanted to be a filmmaker since I was about eight. I think that's around the time that I learned that there was such a job. Um, my dad's okay. a big cinephile, so, and I was very much a daddy's girl growing up. So all our free time we spent watching movies, um, and usually movies that were completely inappropriate for you know a five year old kid like Godfather and Scarface, yeah. and, you know, because he was he was a you know a young man in his late twenties. Like you know, <laughs> what is he going to watch? He's not going to watch a cartoon, of you course. know. Of course. Um, that's like, you know, the previous generation. Now, like everybody just watches cartoons. But, you know, my dad was like, no, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, so so I kind of, you know, I grew up watching all these movies and I was really I love them. And they and I, I was a very imaginative child anyway. And then mm -hmm. around like eight or nine, I discovered that there was such a job because, you know, you only see the actors on screen. And yeah. I was, I, you know, I'm, I'm an introvert and I'm very shy by nature. And so the idea of, of doing anything in front of people was just like, to me, that's a horror story, right? So yeah. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to be that. I was already writing, believe it or not. Like I kind of, you know, I was an avid reader since I learned to read at four and I was just already oh, wow. kind of eating books for, for lunch, you know? Yeah. And so I, I was already kind of writing, but I didn't, I, I also didn't know that it was such a thing as a screenwriter. I mean, mm -hmm. we weren't, we weren't a filmmaking family. My parents are business people. I come from okay. a family of accountants and dentists and doctors and, you know, professors, like nobody was in the arts. And mm -hmm. so I didn't know that any of this existed. So once I learned it existed, I was like, that's what I want to be. And of course, like this family of accountants and doctors and, you know, they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. G good for you. <laughs> it's like all, all the kids want to be astronauts, right? <laughs> right. Um, but I don't know. My dad always says that the only reason, well, not the only reason, but the main reason I'll succeed is because I'm too stubborn not to like, you know, and so <laughs> more people, adults came to me and said, like, that's that's a pipe dream. Like, how, how the hell are you going to do that? Like, there was right. no there's no connection to that at all. Like we can yeah. get you a job in these industries, but not in that one mm -hmm. that I got, I got more and more um, stubborn, but then also at some point realized that it is the talent that I was born with. It's kind of interesting yeah. that, you know, it found me before I even realized that that's what I'm supposed to be doing in life, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of, that's sort of like the person. And then of course, like, uh, specifically you know I mean I discovered theater first when I was a teenager mm -hmm. um, when I was living as a refugee in Croatia and um, and then I subsequently got my undergrad degree in theater directing first uh, once we wow. moved to America and became we came here as war refugees and oh wow and I, you know and I as a straight A student turned to my mother and said and we're we're, we're dirt poor like we're basically living on welfare and have no mm -hmm. no friends no no family, nothing. And I turned around, I was like, I'm going to, uh, with my 4.0 GPA, going to go to college and study theater. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she, God bless her, she didn't say, you know what, Sabina, like maybe business or like medicine or something that can help us financially. Yeah. But she was like, no, that is, that is your dream. So that's what we came here to do and supported me. And that was really remarkable and um so I got my undergrad in theater um moved to New York uh, uh did theater for a handful of years and okay. um and then there was we were contacted by the Bosnian government to if we could go back and reclaim the property that we had to leave when we fled okay um the country and so and I thought that could make an interesting movie I mean not that I knew anything about movies other people suggested it could be a good documentary okay and uh, and I read a book 
because I'm a nerd. Yeah. I, I read a book <laughs> about how to make documentary films. And in it, it yeah. said, hire a cinematographer. I didn't know, you know, I kind of knew what that person did, but didn't really. Right. Um, and so I hired, that's the only person I hired. Otherwise I had my boyfriend at the time and a couple of friends who we were all theater people and they came yeah. with me and my parents and um, that out of that experience came my first film, which was a feature documentary called Back to Bosnia. That's so and, cool. Uh, yeah. And then like, so this is like 20 years after I'd made my big announcement to the world. Here I am presenting this film at AFI Fest on a premiere and uh, the Q&A just struck me. I was like, oh, right. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, I, I kind of knew all along. And since then, I've been I've been doing film and uh, mostly narrative. I mean, I, I don't really that's the only doc I made, but I kind of right. switched. No, stories. That's very, Fictional very cool. Story. Right. Yeah. It's it's nice that I mean it took you a long time, but you got to I think I, I would assume where you want to be making films like this. So um, good for you. Kudos to you for for sticking <laughs> through all of it and and getting it done. Um, but then to actually get into the film, I am curious how. I mean, it's obviously a true story. I always ask, well, how did this idea come up? Well, I mean, it's a true story. So how did this come to you, and how did you make the decision that that this is a story you wanted to tell? So it came to me because I found it really. Um, okay. But I I wanted to tell a story. The idea came to me. Um, around, I mean, it seems like there was a conflict in Gaza all the time, but now even more so. But this was mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Was um, sort of in the news again uh, after a bit, yeah. bit of like, silence from that part of the world, and there is always this consistent narrative that Jews and Muslims hate each other and they've always mm -hmm. hated each other, you know, and I. <sighs> I when we came to United States, that's what the rhetoric was about um, all the different ethnicities in Bosnia as well. It was like you know, the Bosniaks were Muslims and the Serbs and the Croats have always hated each other for thousands yeah. of years. This was inevitable, yeah. and here I am coming from there, going none of that is true. Like what are you talking about? We didn't, yeah. and this came as such a huge surprise to us, you know. And I maybe there, obviously there were individuals who hated the other sides but mm -hmm. i didn't know any and like it was it was just i remembered that narrative and um and i took a look at th those stories and i thought okay well i don't think this is true completely and mm -hmm. i know stories from that my grandmother told me from bosnia but um because right now there's really a very very small population of jews because most of them were killed during world war ii but mm -hmm. she was saying you know when she was a little girl there was a lot more jews and this was before World War II, and mm -hmm. um, and they all coexisted and lived together, and wow. there was never any problems. And so, and I remember her also telling me that some of the Muslims would say, not just Muslims, but other ethnicities, but Muslims specifically would save Jews because they the women were covered back then, and so they could at least hide a Jewish woman under the uh, burqa okay. because the German officers would not ask them to uncover. And show so as long as she was covered and had some sort of fake papers, she could right. rescue. And I thought, wow, that you know, I kind of wanted to explore that, and I started googling, mm -hmm. and then I came across this specific story, and I thought, how is this not a movie already? Like, yeah. <laughs> what? Like this really happened? Like this? This is like what Hollywood movies are written. Like you know, yeah. somebody writes this and you go, yeah, 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 that's such a far fetched idea. It can only yes. happen in Hollywood, right? But it really happened. And I just thought, OK, I have to tell the story. And I sat down and wrote a script. And um, then I won a claims conference grant to make it, which nice. was remarkable. And um, and then decided to make it all in Bosnia with the entire Bosnian cast and crew. And that's what we did. Very cool. Yeah, it, it feels like any other narrative that has kind of come to an end and then well, all of a sudden this incredible thing happens that could never possibly happen in real life but it happened and that's why you know if you didn't know this was a true story you would kind of turn up your nose to it and go no there's no way this is just made for hollywood but that's so yeah. incredible that you were able to find this and you're able to put it you know actually write this this story out completely and then be able to develop it into such a fantastic film so i mean you, you sit there almost in disbelief because i mean even even now i'm thinking did this, did this really happen did, did you did you fabricate this in some way to uh to, to make this this movie 
but no, it, it's just, it's incredible. I, I said it so many times, but it really is incredible that you're able to bring a story like this to life that, like you said, it's not already a movie. How is this not already a movie? We've just done the same things over and over again. Why not this? So, yeah. Yeah. So and I think, you. It, yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I think it's, I think it's not a movie because people don't really, there's a narrative that that's another reason why I made this film is because I want to change the narrative about Bosnia that we're just a country at war. I mean, obviously yeah. there's, there's this joke that we have that every 50 years there's another war, but mm -hmm. in those 50 years of peace, it's a very, we, we're all very, um, interconnected culturally and there is you know the, the wars always come from you know multiple reasons right but like it's sure. usually one or two individuals who are instigating situations you know mm -hmm. but regular people even now like you know you go to, i was just there and making this movie and you know there's been now 30 years since the last war and sure the politicians all hate one another and there's yeah. all these different narratives but when you talk to regular people on the ground they don't care they're just like you know we're live and let live like let's just kind of move on you know right and right i don't know i think it's important to um i just wanted to show bosnia in a different light uh, well i think you did for sure um and and then so with it being a true story i i imagine that going into this you, you're constantly thinking to yourself i have to do this justice i can't if i can't do it right then it's not worth doing especially for a story like this so going into it, how do you know that you're doing it justice throughout the entire process? And then even once it's done, how do you, I would say, have, have enough courage to be like, yes, I have, I've done everything that I need to do to make sure that people understand this completely and, and, and it's just accessible to all. And I've done this story justice. It's a good question. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that I was the most scared of is that I wouldn't portray these characters correctly because mm -hmm. there isn't much, they're all dead, right? And so yeah. there isn't much about them out there other, you know, I read everything I could get my hands on in Bosnia and in English, whatever. And um, and I tried contacting some the descendants of the families and at a time I couldn't get through, I couldn't find them. And so okay. I, I took a story and I said, okay, well, I'm gonna take the plot part, which is all true, and I'm and all these characters really did and existed and everything that I said. The main characters, I I had secondary characters that I made mm. up. Um, okay. But as far as like their character, like I don't know if Zainaba was exactly the way I wrote her. You know, I yeah. just thought, yeah. okay, well, I can base her on my grandmother. I based her on my grandmother. Okay. And you know, I kind of took people from my life and you know characterized the real people that existed and projected mm -hmm. those on them um and in a way then that's for me as a writer I always like to put a little bit of myself in everything and so there's always you know it's not necessarily one character but there's just situations or some moments that I'm like okay this is what I would have done right and right. so but it's it's also you have to be in my you have to be really careful because you know I'm a you know, women living in today, and these are women who lived, you know, in the 40s, and you can't yeah. really just say like, oh, she would do this because I would do that. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they had certain restrictions back then. And sure. and, you know, and that's, that's a part that was the most challenging and most interesting to me, because I had to imagine, especially in Zainab's case, like this woman who comes from a very traditional Muslim household where she is covered, where she is, you know, has a husband and the husband has a brother and the, you know, the men in the family are dictating her every move, you know, right. and how did she still manage to do what she did then spearhead the entire thing mm -hmm. and get them on her side and get them to agree to do, to basically risk their lives for the sake of uh, another family I, I had to, that's why I projected my grandmother, because my grandmother yeah. is somebody who was her age at that time and mm. would have probably done some, you know, I don't know. I just imagine she would have done that. Yeah. That was nonsense. And so, you know, I think that's, that's a long answer to your question of how do you make it authentic while still keeping it true? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it, what's really interesting about the story, another thing that's really interesting about the story is the fact it's it's about a person that has no power mm -hmm. attempting to help someone with no power and yet they shift it completely so then it benefits them and then an entire race of people 
in, in a way. Um, that's, again, that's a story that you see made up for Hollywood. And mm -hmm. it's very, very true. So that's, mm -hmm. it's very cool. Um, I, I mean, I, I do want to, I, I do want to second that because that was really important to me. And the reason why mm -hmm. I was drawn to the story is that there are these, these are two very ordinary women who have yeah. no power in their lives yeah. and they manage to do something extremely powerful. And I just, I feel like it's something we as individuals often forget, right? We, in a mm -hmm. face of sort of um, quote unquote evil or in face of some, some strife that we, we feel so powerless we just mm -hmm. go, oh, you know, I'm just going to look the other way. This, I can't do anything here, you know? And I just wanted to tell a story that shows people just like you can make a change in a world that ricochets for generations to come. So yeah. if, if this, these two women can do it and did it, then you can do it too. And I want to say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very powerful story and, and it, it works very well. So good, again, good for you, good for you. Uh, yeah and then obviously we talked about what some of the challenges were but what what kind of challenges or what, what did you feel was the biggest challenge other than maybe trying to make it as authentic as possible what what other kind of challenges did you face when when creating this you know I mean I think the biggest challenge for me was a personal one um I am from northern Bosnia I'm from a town called Banja Luka um okay. and I left as a child and have spent most of my life in America and um, all my filmmaking other than this documentary, but even in the documentary, I brought my quote unquote crew, the four people that I use from mm -hmm. America. So okay. this was, this was my first, I, for better or worse, I made this decision that I got this money from an American organization and I'm telling a Bosnian story and I want to spend money on Bosnians telling a story. I didn't mm. want to bring anybody from America. And, um, and which meant that I was going to into a country that I know, but a city that I'm not from. So I don't yeah. know anyone in this town, especially no, nobody in the film industry at all. Mm. And um, I had to go in there and convince them that I wanted to make this film and then get the best people that I could possibly get to want to make a film with me. And I think that to me was the most challenging because it's the first film that I've ever made without um, having friends by my side. You know, okay. like these people see my friends as we were making the film, mm -hmm. but you know, I was going in with, you know, usually it's like at least one or two people, like your core group of people you keep bringing yeah. with you, right? Mm -hmm. And like maybe people you met in film school or people you started making videos with, you know, in your basement when you were a teenager, whatever it was, like right. there's somebody that you're bringing with you who's kind of like your safety blanket, right? Or like yeah. somebody who gets you that you don't have to explain a lot to. And right. um, I didn't have that. And that to me was a huge challenge because, and especially because such this is the biggest film that I've made. Yeah. Um, and so I had to very quickly um, create a situation in which they trust me and I trust them and they yeah. had to just jump in with me without really knowing who I am. And yeah. um, so that that was, you know, it's like you kind of have to live on the edge every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I met it's like starting a new job and you have an entirely an entire new team around you and you still have to figure out how to produce because you're still expected to do your job. And I, yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 it's exactly <laughs> what you said. It's exactly what you said. It's incredibly challenging. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, and people don't think, I mean, it is like, it's like, you know, you go to a new company, but it's like you're coming into a company to be like the CEO and they all right. have, they all know each other and they all have the rapport and they're looking at you and like, who the hell are you? You know, yeah. you're not my boss, but like, what? I've never heard of you. And so, you know, of course you have people in, in the group of this individuals who are, who want to challenge you, who want to question mm -hmm. you want to usurp their own power on top of you you know and so you just have to know how to navigate that and how not to let your ego get in a way and um you know and that was that was a good it was a good challenge yeah and I, I was gonna say I, I would assume that you want everyone to be able to speak up and you want mm -hmm. their input or you wouldn't have them as part of the film if you don't value their opinion I don't think it does, I don't think it works so what's it like balancing that balancing you you know you know what you're doing you know that you're bringing an expertise to the table but you also know that these people that you've never worked with 
are probably very good at their job or they wouldn't be in the position that they're in. How do you balance that, that, that type of power? I am a, yeah, maybe because my background was primarily in theater, you know, um, mm. I, I take collab collaboration to the max, you know, I, I'm very much, I always joke that I'm like a benevolent dictator, you know, and yeah. in, in a way, like I, I, everybody, I have a vision and I know what I want, but I also really um, value opinions of people that are working with me, even if they're, you know, a PA, like mm -hmm. a PA comes, you know, not necessarily in the middle of the, sh the take, but, you know, if we're struggling and we can't figure out how to do something, anybody's opinion is welcome. Like I don't have, okay. Um, I don't have any sort of ego about that, you know, because at yeah. the end of the day, and and then I also think what's really, really important is that you respect all the people that you're working with, no matter yeah. who they are, and what they're doing, and to be really grateful for what they're bringing to the table. I think there's a lot of, you know, when you have that pressure on set as a director, and especially somebody who's, you know, you're trying to quote unquote, prove yourself to a group of people yeah. as well as lead them at the same time, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, if you are not very secure in who you are as an individual, um, it can be very tempting to turn into a bit of a, a bully, right? To be like, yeah. no, no, I know best, I know best, trust me. Trust me, yeah. I come from America and I know better. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but to me, like I, I, I find that at the end of the day, here the film is finished, and who mm. are you interviewing? You're interviewing me. Who is being the face of this film? Who is getting, quote unquote, you know, the accolades? It's me. It's always going to be me. And so, you know, which do I think it's fair? No. I mean, there's people who yeah. worked on this film incredibly hard, whose talent is unbelievable and yet nobody's really going to talk about it like yeah. my prop master is is a wizard i mean the stuff that he would just pull out of the hat i'm like what is happening you know who are you and where have you been my whole <laughs> life you know? and but you know and so it is on me that i show them the respect that they they deserve even if the world doesn't necessarily give them all the accolades that they deserve as well sure you know? That's kind of a cool position to be in, I would imagine, that you you kind of get to be the liaison for everyone that appreciates them because you get to tell them how much you appreciate them and express to them that you understand what a great job they're doing. And I mean, your success hinges on their success and vice versa. So that's a very that's a very cool position to be in, I, I would imagine. Um and it and it and it works. Like I said, it, everything shines through. I think appropriately. Everything comes through the way that I believe it was meant to. So it's it's very clearly a team effort, and and it seems that you guys worked very well together. So yeah, we did. I mean, I, yeah. I you know, as challenging as it was to win this group of solid and very very talented individuals to my side to basically say, you know, you guys just trust me. I know what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, as challenging as that was, I mean, I'm very happy that for the most part it really worked and mm -hmm. they really trusted me and uh, were willing to do, to go way beyond any sort of expectation that I brought on them. I mean, it was really one of the best working environments that I've been in and not awesome. just with the crew, but with the cast as well. I mean, the, some of the actors that, that were in the film are really, really established in the region. They're just sort okay. of like movie stars of the region. And, you know, and I'm a nobody in their eyes. Like, who the hell is this woman, right? And so, you know, you kind of have to, again, it's all about respect. It's listening to what they have to bring to the table and giving them freedom to bring their ideas and express them. And, and then you take those ideas that work for the film yeah awesome fantastic mm -hmm. um and then so you kind of answered this question a little bit already but one of my big concerns when it comes to short films is the ones that don't do so well or the ones that i'm not super interested in where i didn't enjoy too much i feel like the thing that they're always lacking is a very quick character development you, you need to have characters established very early that are accessible and understandable um and even likable even if they're the bad guy they need to be likable in some respect and you do that very well with with the two main characters how do you go about i know you talked about developing them and 
how do, how do you make the film as a whole accessible? But how do you make those two characters develop so quickly? Because you don't give yourself a ton of time. So how do you go about attacking that early on and establishing that and sustaining that throughout? I think the that's a challenge of short films, especially when you have a short mm -hmm. film like this one is in which a lot happens. You know, yeah. I think a lot of short films, you know, there's one maybe main conflict that happens at some point. And, but this, you know, it just keeps happening and happening. And I yeah. wanted the tension to be throughout. And there's a lot, I mean, just, you know, when I was doing the poster for the film, it's like, usually we have maybe one or two main characters where I'm like, okay, well, this person is like, it's seven people, right? When you yeah. list everybody, because it's two, it's three families. And then there's this bad guy, right? But then there's yeah. also the, you know, 50 years later, like the people. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it was really, um, it was a challenge as a writer. Um, I had an amazing, I have a, a uh, writing mentor that I met in film school. His name is Richard Kletter. And okay. uh, I brought him on board when um, I was developing this script. I said, hey, you know, uh, I'm trying to squeeze a lot of story into 20 minutes on screen. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to, you know, can I send you my second or third draft? And so he came on board and really helped me shape it. And he's very tough. Like he's he's not someone who's going to hold your hand. He's just going to be like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> And you have to, and so I, I'm really grateful to him. And, uh, but I think that the way you establish character is by giving them conflict on a first mm. or second stage and see how they handle that conflict, you know. And so, as in Zainab's case, that's why we have her be confronted by her sister-in-law on in a first scene. I mean, she's already mm. she has a secret, you know. And I really wanted, I wanted the theme of secrets and sort of. Um, not necessarily imprisonment, but like the outside um, controlling the nature. Yep. So I we took it sort of in production design. We took it both li literally and figuratively in terms of you know if you if you watch the film, you can find all the symbolism about na nature, actual nature being um, controlled by man, right? By by mankind. Yep. So you know, have water is running, it's not running. You have birds being caged in. You have all these elements that we just, and then we reflected that on Zainaba, whose character, whose nature of somebody who is an activist and who wants to do something in a world is being um, controlled by the culture and the environment that she lives in. And she's sort of boxed in and trying to escape. And so I really wanted to give her a situation in a first or a second scene in which that can be shown. And when yeah. she, you know, she kind of first tries to, you know, obey the rules, right? Because we all do, yeah. right? You know, like yeah. even, the, even the rebels in, in the family are like, well, first I'm going to be a nice person. Like I'm going to try my best. I'm going to try my best. And then you, you emerge out of it. And I think that was my way of, of trying to, as you put it, like, create a character that within a first minute of the film, you get a sense of who she is. So then when she does what she does, it's not a surprise. You know? Right. That, that's what I've found to be the, the one thing in common across all short films that I, that I find enjoyable is that they are able to establish someone very quickly because without that human connection, you kind of lose something. You're, you're unable to bridge the gap between the viewer and the content on screen. So the characters are essential to the story, obviously, but especially in a short film where you just have to establish them so quickly. Right. And make them an underdog if you can, right? Yes. Even if even I, if they're not really, but like, yeah, she's an underdog in her family. So, you know, yeah. How do, yeah. everybody loves an underdog. Everybody loves an underdog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then, so I, I feel like the most prominent part of this, of your story is the fact that it takes place over 50 years. I mean, it starts in the 40s and it ends in the 90s. And you, when one thing ends, it very quickly transitions to the next. Um, but you're still effectively, it's still effectively taking place over the course of 50 years because they're still developing as characters behind the scenes. You're not necessarily seeing it until all of a sudden they're back on screen again. So you do have, you do have text that comes up on screen and helps to establish a setting and a, and a time. But you give viewers about 30 seconds to sort of figure those things out on their own before you tell them directly. And I think it comes through very well, even it, it, if it's with the small radio, like that wouldn't have been a thing that someone would have had sitting in their house, not, uh, not that style in the 1940s. 
So you do a really good job of that. But how did you approach this time jump? And how did you make sure that that was accessible? And people were able to understand that, oh, we've just jumped 50 years with the same characters and they have developed behind the scenes while we haven't been looking. Um, actually, interestingly, that's something that was a, a pickup shoot. So okay. I didn't, you know, in a script, when you write it, it makes sense, right? So it's like, you know, cut two, and then you have mm. a super and, you know, so you read the script and it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And mm. we shot it the way it's in a script and then edited it. And you, it, it would, it originally went from the family, the scene of them at dinner, and then it would just cut to the old woman in this apartment and you mm -hmm. have a stoop. And um, I sent it to um, a handful of friends in America. Cause I also, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted, it's very easy for uh, Bosnians cause we know, we know both eras, we know both wars. Yeah. We're very Like for us, when you say 1993 Bosnia, we know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, this is a, not a film that I'm making for a local community. And this is a film I'm making for a global audience. I sent, I'm sent it to people who don't know anything about Bosnian war other than yeah. the stories that heard through me, you know, and do they know what year it happened? Mm, I don't think so. Yeah. So I sent it to them and, um, you know, between all the different feedback that we got in different editing moments, the one consistent one was, wait, what? Like it's 50 years later. And so they would lose the first scene between her and her daughter in mm -hmm. 1993 because they were trying to figure out what is going on and you know and and so by the time they figured out what was going on the film was over yeah. and so i you know i i listened to everybody's feedback and we didn't really have the money to do any sort of a major reshoot like or anything the actors weren't available like we couldn't you know and so i sat down and i started thinking about it i took a weekend i think mm -hmm. it's like a couple of days and then I came up with this. I was like, okay, how I started a film with these. I, I knew that I was going to start a film like that because there was this, uh, with these sort of neutral images while you overhear a story being told to a kid. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, maybe I can do the same thing. But now it's going to be a radio that tells us the story, that we are the kid listening to the story. And what are the images? And in what way can those images mimic the images that we had in the first? So that the transition is the same as what gets us into the story. So it's like once yeah. upon a time, you know, it's kind of like that. And yeah. um, and then I just came up with a with a list of possible things that we could pick up, and uh, we were actually able to get back into the location of the um, apartment and do all these little pickups over one like couple of hours one morning, and mm. then went back. And then you know I had to go find this radio thing and so then we researched that my editor helped me and once we put it all together I was I was very happy with the result and I think that it has you know as you point out like I think it solves this you know it gives us a sec it gives us a second to digest what we just watched and transition yeah. so it's like oh now you know like one one entree is over like now you're getting the second one yes you know? yeah yeah I think um like I said I think if you had just thrown the text up on screen and everyone had to just digest that very quickly and say, okay, it's 1993. Why is it 1993? I think we, we get a chance to figure out why, or at least play out in our mind, why we think it's 1993 when you give us that, sh that short time before you tell us directly. Um, and I like that because I, I think, like you said, you said that some people kind of missed the end because they, by the time they figure out what's going on, that's a very short part of the film that it goes by very, very quickly. I mean, they go from A to Z, like in the blink of an eye. And yeah. es establishing the way that you did, because it, it's almost a big chunk of that final act where you're you're panning the apartment and and seeing seeing the setup, but it works. It's not it's not wasted, which I imagine you could have been worried was a risk. Uh that that you potentially could have wasted that that 30 seconds, but it, it works. So yeah, I mean, the, the one number one rule that was drilled into me in film school is mm -hmm. do not leave your audience confused. Do yeah. not leave your audience confused. And so I thought, okay, and I, you know, I've done it in the past and I've I've not really don't have anything against it, but I feel like 
in this short film that was warranted, it, the sort of, um, you know, some suggestions were like, just go to black and then just have text come up. And I'm like, no, 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 I want the momentum. Like I want people to, you know, I don't want to slow down. And then suddenly then I have to re rile them back up again. Like I wanted mm -hmm. the tension, sort of the emotions that you've had to stay with you. And how do you still tell that transition without really like taking a break? You know, because then right. like, going to black and going like we're not doing that. I I wanted I wanted something, um, I don't know, more of a transition. Like it's it comes from my theater days. You know, it's like how do you transition from one scene to another um, in an interesting way? And so yeah, that was my homage to my theater training. <laughs> well, there you go, and it works again. It works. Um, and then so I know that this is uh, just kind of making its rounds right now. Uh, the fact that I came across it pretty recently means it's not available everywhere yet, I would imagine. Um, but is there somewhere that that my viewers can can find this and watch it? So we ha we are about to have our festival premiere um, mm -hmm. in two days, three days um, okay. in Cleveland. So uh, it's going to be screening at Cleveland International Film Festival on the 30th. And cool. um, and then we have a bunch of other festivals that we're waiting to hear from, um, and hopefully it'll be making its round around the United States and the world yeah. uh, very soon. Um, so in the meantime, I would say the best, you know, you could see the trailer by um, going, if you just put it in YouTube, it's there's a trailer, or you can follow us um, on our social media. We have, we have both Instagram and Facebook, and whenever some sort of a screening, whether it's through a festival or a private screening pops up, we're going to make sure to post it there. So it's at setup.film. I will, I will post a link in, uh, right. in with the video so that everyone can find that um yeah, and then you. of course and then i'm i'm sure with the festival run coming up that you're going to be incredibly busy but are are you working on anything else right now of course what filmmaker yeah. isn't already making the next movie <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you know um i i mean there's a couple of things i mean one is that i would really like to turn this into a feature film so we're okay. you know using sort of the short not, I mean, I didn't make it as a proof of concept, but it's kind of mm. becoming that and trying to raise money um, to make a feature version in a year, a couple of years, whenever, however long it takes. Um, cool. And then in the meantime, I have I have a, a feature film that is set in a Bosnian community in Florida that we're raising money for right now that we're hoping to shoot sooner than later, sometime this year. Very nice. <laughs> well, well, when whenever those happen, um please let me know. I'd love to to watch them and review them as well. Um, my review for this okay. film is not out yet. I'm going to actually post it as soon as we get off uh, the chat here. Um, so that will be available to you very shortly. Um, so, it's very so positive. Okay, yes, yeah, so I was going to say, like, you know, since so, so I'm just like, can we do a redo if, like, you said really bad stuff about the film? <laughs> I can just be well, like, um... <laughs> if if you couldn't tell, if you couldn't tell, I, I did very much enjoy the film. So you had you got very good feedback um but yeah i don't remember what i what i rated it i can't remember but it was it was a very good rating and i said very nice things at least i think they were very nice um but i'll go back i'll edit <laughs> and um and i'll make sure it sounds nice when, when i post it thank you thank you uh, of, no pressure no pressure just be yeah. honest just be honest of course of course <laughs> um and then i have one more question for you um what are some of your favorite films oh a good one um you know, I mean, every year there's a new favorite film, right? Yeah. You know, that you add to the file. Uh, but some that have stood the test of time, um, I would say In a Mood for Love is okay. one of my favorites. Um, uh, Thin Red Line, I think, is one of the best anti-war films. I don't know. I, I'm, I, And as this year, speaking of anti-war films, my favorite this past year was All Quiet on a Western Front. I thought, I thought that, was that was very good. It's a masterpiece in my mind. I just thought it was remarkable. Yeah. Um, I tend to like films that have uh, not necessarily an unhappy ending, but kind of have a um, realistic ending, you know? Yeah. And so I, I kind of gravitate towards movies like that, and that definitely fit the bill. So, well, it, I mean, it, it, those films make more sense because you don't always get a happy ending in real life. So it, it kind of yeah. helps you identify with the characters and the storyline much more when they don't get that happy ending 
or when something tragic has happened at the end. Um, so that again, that that like you just said, All Quiet on the Western Front was a great example. I wish that I had seen the original uh, before I saw this one. It's not a film that I had seen before, so I didn't have anything to compare it to, but I thought it was fantastic. I think that everything that it won at the Academy Awards this year was well-deserved. Yeah, 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 I would agree with that. That was yeah. definitely a good year. It was a good year in that way. Yeah, it was a very good year in general for movies, in my in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's hope it keeps going, right? You know, that yeah, we, we, I hope need, it we need good, good movies and, and good, yeah. good audience involvements. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we need more original content, and I think 2023 was very good for that. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, Sabina, thank you again so much for sitting down with me. I had a fantastic time. The movie's fantastic. Um, and I'm looking forward to everything that you do next. Uh, please be in touch. And I, I, like I said, I'd love to review the films when they come out in the future. I'll post that review in just a few minutes and, uh, hopefully you enjoy it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it. You're more than it. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You have a fantastic day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Thanks. Bye.